G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for yet another pre-season uh, video. The pre-season seems to be dragging on. I think emotionally I became ready uh, for football at around Jan 30th. I think mean, that was my first upload for the year. And it uh, feels like I've been making content for a good while now, and yet we're still uh, only two weeks closer to round one. So about four weeks from when it all kicks off. Of course, the pre-season games are just around the corner as well. I think there's some kicking off in late February. I think there's some unofficial matches and then a round of official matches as well. Uh, so it's all very, very exciting. And the pre-season content, uh, I'll just keep churning out. In today's video, I'm gonna be taking a look at uh, the upcoming season and looking at which players probably need a big year uh, for a variety of reasons, to be honest. So when I compile this list, you know, naturally the first place you look at is which players are out of contract because those there's inherent pressure on players in a contract year to deliver well to ensure that they get another contract. So there is a fair bit of that in this list, but not everyone on this list is an out of contract player. I also added a couple of players that I think simply uh, they, maybe their team needs them to have a big impact or perhaps they need to start delivering on some sort of promise. So I picked 10 players and we're gonna go through the list one by one. Today's video is of course sponsored by Jerusy's Athlete Academy, which I've been talking about heaps on the channel, but it's uh, starting to grow. It's getting quite a few clients through the door, which is great to see. So whether you are a young prospective athlete who wants to take their game to the next level and you're looking for someone to design a personalized SNC program to you and your sport and your specific goals, Jerusy's Athlete Academy is a great place to go, but it's not just for young athletes. It can be for anyone who's just starting out at the gym, wants to build themselves up, doesn't really want to rely on the guesswork of going online and trying to find, you know, sift through all the bro science. Drewsy is a fully qualified sports scientist and there's a program there for you as well. So letting you know that you can get 20% off any of his programs if you use the code TRUEFOOTY20 uh, and the details for all of that is in the description of this video. As I said, guys, it's been great uh, getting back on the YouTube bandwagon. I'm really enjoying uploading videos again and uh, slowly and surely some of you guys are starting to come back, which is great. Really appreciate all the support so far. I will mention though that about 42% of the people who have watched my videos in the last, you know, 28 days over that period, 42% uh, of people have not actually hit subscribe. So if you could do us a favor, help grow the channel, which is something I'm uh, really motivated to do right now. It'd be a big help if you just hit subscribe. So thanks. I've got some exciting plans in the works. I can't really talk to you about them yet, but I've got some life plans. I think my life is about to change very very drastically um, and I'm on the precipice of being able to tell you a little bit more about it but um, I think 2023 is gonna be a pretty interesting year for true footy uh, to say the least so make sure you hit subscribe and uh, join us for that uh, the journey that will be this year I'm excited to let you know what is happening maybe in a couple weeks all right let's crack into the list of players that I think need to have a big year in 2023 I'm gonna start with Mitch McGovern, who of course signed a five-year contract to swap from Adelaide to Carlton uh, four years ago. So he's in the fifth and final year of that contract, which was reportedly on $800,000 a year. And I think it's fair to say that what the, the return on investment from a Carlton perspective hasn't quite matched um, you know, what they were hoping to get out of him. His, his form has fluctuated naturally. I think he was originally recruited you know, as that third tall forward, um, and that, that might not be where he plays in the future. But injury has also been a big factor with Mitch McGovern, unfortunately. It was interesting to see he's never played played more than 16 games in a single season for Carlton, which was his first year at the club, and since then he's only never played more than 12 games in a season. Last season, we did see him flagged for a switch to the back line, and I think he had a little bit of success in that role throughout the start of 2022, but of course went down with, uh, I think it was a hamstring injury and only played seven games for the year, which has just been the tale of his time at Carlton so far. In round one, he's likely to line up alongside likes of Wietering and Lewis Young as that third tall back sort of intercepting defender, much like a smaller version of his brother. I'm pretty optimistic that we will see a much improved Mitch McGovern. Based on what we saw last year, we'll see a better version of him this year, but it is a contract year and therefore there is pressure on him to earn another contract that isn't going to be an enormous pay cut. The next player I wanted to highlight is uh, Matt Crouch, who has had uh, an interesting last few years at the Adelaide Crows. Of course, historically, he's been a very important midfield cog for them. He's played 136 games for the club and was a very good player in that side that made the grand final and ultimately lost. He's been a prodigious ball winner, you know, th through that period, that 2017 to 2020 period. Uh, but naturally, you know, what's happened at Adelaide is the club's kind of fallen over a little bit, gone through a lot of adversity, and naturally have a very new vision for what the future is going to entail. He missed 2021 through injury and last year just played the 11 games and was dropped after a 31 possession game against the Gold Coast Suns. It was then reported in late July from memory that Crouch had actually been told that his contract was not going to be renewed something like 15 months before his contract was actually set to expire. So if you believe the articles, he's already told that he's not getting another contract at Adelaide at the end of this year. 
Now, I think it would be foolish to assume that that is set in stone. A lot can change in 12 months if Crouch has a good year, but he will be an unrestricted free agent at the end of the season. So regardless, from a Matthew Crouch perspective, this is a huge year for him to try and prove that he is worthy of you know either getting another contract at Adelaide or perhaps getting a contract at another club. I think his best case scenario is probably having a really strong, consistent year where he gets a lot of game time for the Crows and earns a fairly lucrative contract at another club if need be. And it's also worth noting that you know, at his age, I think he will be 28 this year. This could be the last contract that he signs if he does join another club. So what will make it tough for Crouch is if Adelaide don't see him as a big part of their future and plan to offload him at the end of the year, then there's a chance that, uh, well, he doesn't get a good crack to earn that extra big contract. Although it probably works in Adelaide's favor if they give him the opportunity to shine, he gets a better contract in another club and then they, you know, presumably get a compensation pick out of it. So regardless, any way you slice it, Crouch needs a big year. Next, I want to talk about Jordan Dugowie. Uh And Jordan Dugowie probably stands out on this list because he just signed an enormous contract worth five years. He's got the job security. That's what makes him different to the other prospects that I've just mentioned. However, he does come with a lot of baggage. Obviously, there was a lot of off-field drama, you know, last year, which we won't rehash, but obviously there was issues overseas in the US. And then there was that Bali video, which, you know, got a lot of headlines in a contract here. And ultimately... While there was a lot of talk that he would switch clubs, notably to St Kilda, right at the end of the piece there, uh, he ended up signing on the dotted line for Collingwood for another five years. He's also not a player that has been underperforming in any kind of way, to be honest. His output has been pretty good. Last year, I think he averaged 20 disposals a game and just about a goal a game on top of that, and then played in uh, all three finals and had two pretty big performances in both the qualifying final and the semi-final. However, I still think this looms as a big year for Jordan Dugowie to start to announce himself as being one of the better plays in the competition because I do think he does have that potential. He's just been rewarded with a uh, you know fairly large contract and it's time for him to deliver on the faith shown in him. The evolution of Jordan Dugowie as a player has been an interesting one. In 2018, you know, he played predominantly as a forward kick, 48 goals in a side that made the grand final. And as time's gone on, his forward output has dropped and his midfield output has raised. Obviously, he's playing a little bit more midfield. So it'll be an interesting one to watch. How do they optimize the talent of Jordan Dugowie? If they need him in the midfield, fair enough. He's a good midfielder, but he's also extremely dangerous around goals. So I think that's not a, a strength that Colin would want to take away from. So I think that will be an interesting one to watch this year. My point is that I think Dugowie needs to repay the faith shown in him by Collingwood, not just for you know the sake of his legacy, but also his team's flag chances, as they are a big chance to win the flag in 2023. Next, I'll talk about uh, perhaps a left field one, but I'm going to go with Harrison Jones at Essendon. I don't think there's pressure on him to deliver on the promise straight away. I think he'll be a fourth year key position forward uh, who naturally we need to be patient with, obviously, but there does come with some degree of pressure to see you know a talented prospect develop uh, into the player that we think he can be. I think he just needs a bit of momentum in that space. And 2023, I think, looms as a big year for him, especially when you consider the fact that he will be out of contract. For the context, he's a 22-year-old key position forward, about 196 centimeters. He's played 26 games, and it probably would have been more, but he's had a pretty unlucky run with injury, especially in recent times. He missed half of 2022 through injury return mid-season, and he showed some promising signs, kicked a few bags of two goals, but there was some indifferent form in that as well, as you understand, as a young player who didn't hit double-digit disposals uh, at any point from round 13, if I'm not mistaken. So where I would argue the need and the pressure to perform comes from is that from his perspective, it's a contract year, and if he has a pretty good year, then it's potentially a lucrative one. Additionally, the Dons clearly need to see some improvement in terms of wins and losses, and he could shape as an important player to seeing that genuine organic improvement from within. With Peter right there in support, obviously Jake Stringer as well, Tipper coming back into the fold, I think he's well poised to take the next step in 2023. Next, I want to talk about the young Hawthorne gun, James Warple, who was, of course, a late draft pick back in 2017. Pick 45, I think it was, burst onto the scene and immediately had everyone going, how the hell was this kid drafted so late? In just his second season at AFL level in 2019, he averaged nearly 27 touches a game and won his club's best and fairest as well, which is a remarkable achievement for a guy that was, you know, 20 that year. Since then, it's clear to see that he has struggled to recapture that form. I think last year he played uh, just the 11 games, and yes, there was some injury involved in that, but he did get dropped 
once as well, which was hard to imagine back in 2019 when he was doing the things he was as a 20-year-old. It has been a little while since we've seen the best out of James Warple, and obviously I'm not writing him off. I think he's capable of pretty big things at AFL level, but as well, you consider the fact that Hawthorne have just shed all the experience uh, that they have, in particularly in that midfield with Mitchell and O'Meara making away. It's time for James Warple to step up and become a young leader of this football club, and they're going to need some really solid output from him in 2023. And again, surprise, surprise, it's a contract year for him. So a good year here potentially nets him a pretty lucrative contract going forward. Next, I want to highlight Matt Tabernett from the Fremantle Football Club, who has been a pretty divisive player, uh, even just on the True Footy YouTube channel. You know, Bush uh, has always had issues with Tabernett and Joyce, who would always defend him. But either way, I think he looms as an important cog in their forward line, particularly structurally, as the key forward question is one, uh, as I've said many times previously, is one question that Fremantle have never fully answered since Pavlich. You know, they're, they're about to enter presumably a premiership window or at least, you know, start the last step before the premiership window. With Lobb leaving the club, that's an avenue to goal that I missed out on. Lobb kicked 36 goals last year. Jai Amos was pick eight uh, 2021 and looks like a great prospect, but it's far too early for him to really shoulder too much of that key forward responsibility, to be honest. So I think Tabana really presents as an important player structurally for Fremantle. The first step for him will be getting his body right. So he hasn't played more than 16 games in a season since 2016, and in that year he played 17 games, which is the most he's ever played. It's not a contract year for Tabana. It's more from the perspective of where Fremantle are at, it's really important for him to have a big year, particularly when last year it didn't go so great. So if he fails to fire this year, I think it will make it difficult for Fremantle to really generate scores big enough to consistently win games. And I'm sure they're aiming for you know that top six level again. So Tabano is a really important player for that. He needs to have a good year. Next, we'll talk about Braden Pruce of the GWS Football Club, who was recruited to fill what is a gaping hole in their list, let's be honest, as the number one ruck. Um, Obviously, he failed to hit the mark in 2022. He just played 10 games uh, and missed all of 2021 due to injury as well. So for him, the story has been injury rather than poor form. But suffice it to say, he was not recruited to fulfill the function that GWS got him for, having just played 10 games across the two years. And it's the final year of his contract as well. So again, there's this inherent need to perform for you know both the team's sake. They really need a number one ruck who's firing. And secondly, for his own benefit as well, to ensure that he gets a contract worthy of his talent. The Giants have uh, played Matt Flynn a lot in that role, and I think he's developing fine, but obviously the extra support of a Braden Pruce in that side uh, offers a lot, I think. Pruce averaged 33 hitouts a game in the games that he did play in 2022, so I think that would be some very welcome ruck support for the Giants. So I think he's one player that they really need to have a good year. The next player that I think needs a good year, to be honest, is Elliot Yo. And Elliot Yo has historically probably been, it's very subjective, but I think probably a top three player at West Coast during their prime years. He won the best and fairest in 17 and 18. Obviously, 18 was a premiership year. So best and fairest in a premiership season. Since 2020, he's been absolutely dogged by injuries. He's played just 27 games of a possible 68. The story of his injury is that in 2020, he came down with osteitis pubis. And for an explosive player who relies on that uh, part of the body, so to speak, that is a pretty bad injury, let alone for anyone. To be honest, it doesn't really seem like until now it had fully recovered and there was other injuries popping up as well. I think he did a calf early last year and genuinely he has not had the athleticism that he's had in previous years. So again, we're not talking about a player who's in a contract year. I I think he's got some pretty solid job security, but I think he needs to recapture his previous form as much for his own legacy as much as anything else. West Coast will be, you know, committing to this slow list cull over time of their veterans, and Yo's probably a few brackets down from the guys you expect to go next, so I think he's still got some good football in him. He's had a pretty good preseason from all reports. So I think he's one player that, even just from a personal point of view, he needs to have a good year because it's been three pretty average ones. Then I want to talk about Orazio Fantasia of the Port Adelaide Footy Club, who had a pretty promising start to his career in Port Colours in 2021. He played 15 games and he kicked 28 goals and looked like a very dangerous small forward in a team that uh, was very, very strong that year. Last year, however, he didn't play a single game due to injury. So a huge blow in terms of the momentum, I guess, of his career. We started to see the... full evolution of Orazio Fantasia as a small forward, and he had a season completely wiped out from injury. Now, the power fell out of finals last year, of course, and that's not down to one player not playing games, but obviously, I felt that there was a clear lack of goal-scoring options, or at least their ability to score was reduced. So Marshall kicked 45 goals as their main key forward target, and their second highest goal scorer was Sam Powell Pepper, who 
has carved out a little niche there as a half forward, but again, not your typical avenue to go in the sense that he's there in the side to kick goals. I think there is a clear gap there. So Fantasia Looms is an important player to fill in that gap, padding out that top five goal kickers with actual genuine forward line goal kickers. They've also recruited uh, Willie Rioli, or Junior Rioli rather, and Jason Horn Francis as well. So suddenly there is actually a little bit of competition in that forward six. You'd imagine Rioli and Horn Francis will be given games. So when you consider the fact that uh, Fantasia is coming back from injury, it is also a contract year. He's got a renewed sense of competition in that forward line. I think that will actually serve him well. Suddenly Port Adelaide have um, some pretty dangerous small options going forward. I still think from Fantasia's perspective, though, he needs to make the season count in order to prolong his AFL career. And again, you know, money is a big factor here. He's out of contract. He needs to earn those dollars. The 10th player and final player on this list that I want to mention is Hunter Clark from the St. Kilda Footy Club, who I've talked about in the past as a player that I really thought was going to take the next step, but I can't keep putting on these lists. And now it's time for him to to deliver. He was a high draft pick in 2017, pick seven from memory. And I think there's been clear signs of promise. He's, he's a gifted player in terms of athleticism and, and just general football intelligence, I think. But naturally, he has failed to deliver in any real big meaningful way. And I think part of the problem there is he hasn't quite worked out what position is best for him. So I think he turns 24 this season, and there's still a little bit of a question mark. Is he a halfback flanker or is he a midfielder? Injuries have also not gone his way as well. He just played the eight games last season, and again, he finds himself in a contract year. So again, there's that pressure for him to earn. In theory, when you turn 24, if you're in the prime of your career, that should be the biggest contract that you earn. And so for him, he's not in a great bargaining position right now to negotiate potentially the biggest contract of his career. So there is that pressure for him to perform this season. It's not that as though that he's overly old, but you know, he's turning 24. The clock is ticking for him to prove why he was drafted at pick seven. And it'll be interesting to see under the new Ross Lyon era where Lyon thinks that Hunter Clark plays his best footy. He considered moving to North Melbourne uh, late in the piece, I think in the trade period, ended up staying and St Kilda naturally will be hoping that that decision pays off for them. All right, guys, thanks for listening to this video about 10 players who I think need to have a big year in 2023. But naturally, the list goes on. I'm sure every club has a couple uh, that they want to mention, you know, some top-end players, some might just be fringe players or young players uh, that they think have a lot of promise. But let me know in the comments who from your club do you think needs to have a big year and what your prediction is. Will they deliver on the expectation or do you think they'll fade it into the abyss? As always, guys, really appreciate your support. Stay tuned for um, some interesting developments on the channel coming soon. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.